Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Karen Garcia from the American Chemical Society. And hi, everyone. I am Stephanie Slonkin. I'm also uh, from the American Chemical Society and um, just want to give a brief overview of our organization. So founded in 1876 and chartered by the US Congress, the American Chemical Society, or ACS, is one of the world's largest scientific organizations with more than 150,000 members in over 130 countries. Our mission is to advance the broader chemistry enterprise and its practitioners for the benefit of Earth and its people. Karen and I represent the external affairs and communications team at the ACS, which advances its mission through events such as these and by promoting chemistry internationally and with elected officials. Hello and happy Tuesday. As my collaborators, Karen and Stephanie mentioned, we're thrilled to welcome you here today. My name is Aaron Mertz. I'm the founding director of the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program, which was launched in 2019 with the mission to raise public trust in science and to help foster a more diverse and engaged scientific workforce. We're excited to team up with the American Chemical Society for this event. We have nearly 400 people registered for this exciting discussion. A couple of housekeeping matters. The moderated discussion will last until about 1.45 Eastern time, and then we will turn to public questions. Some people submitted questions in advance and we have noted those. You can submit questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. And we've also turned on the chat feature so you can comment publicly on what is being discussed and or share resources with the other attendees. It's an honor to introduce our moderator, my fantastic scientific colleague, Dr. Shruti Nayak, who is a world-renowned skin biologist and immunologist. Dr. Nayak is an assistant professor at New York University School of Medicine. She received her PhD in immunology from the University of Pennsylvania and performed her postdoctoral training at the Rockefeller University. She has discovered that normal bacteria living on our skin educate the immune system and help protect us from harmful pathogens. For her cutting edge research, she has been recognized by the Regeneron Award for Creative Innovation, the L'Oreal for Women in Science Award, the Blavatnik Award for Young Scientists, and most recently, she was named a Pew Scholar and a Packard Fellow. Dr. Nayak, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our other esteemed guests. Thank you so much, Erin, for that incredibly kind introduction. And to the Aspen Foundation and NACS for putting together this uh, fantastic panel. Um, before I introduce the, the panelists who are incredible scientists, I want to mention that their full biographies are, uh, are distributed on the email and then as well um, on the Aspen Foundation website. So I wanna start by introducing our fantastic panelists. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Kelly A. Dobbs, who is a cosmetic chemist. Um, she is a skincare co and color cosmetic form formulation expert and the 2019 president of Society of Cosmetic Chemists. So welcome, Kelly. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nala Kumalo, who is the chair of the Department of Dermatology founder and head of the Hair, Skin, and Research Laboratory at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. She's an expert in skin and hair structure and cosmetics applied to them. So um, welcome, Nala. I think we're just waiting for her to turn her, her camera and microphone. Um, welcome. Hello. Um, and then finally, Dr. Ann Wagner, who is a protein engineer and biochemist and a group leader at L'Oreal, who specializes in mass market hair color brands. So I'm really excited to hear from the three of you with such, both with, who have such a diverse background in chemistry and the biology of skin and how these uh, factors interrelate. So uh, I know we only have an hour, so I wanna jump right in and ask you all to sort of start by discussing how chemistry is relevant to, maybe talk a little bit about the work you do and discuss how chemistry is relevant to that work. Um, so maybe we could start off with Kelly. Sure. Um, as a, you know, a former formulation scientist, I can speak to the fact that you use chemistry every day in, in developing products for consumers. Um, but it's also a multidisciplinary approach. So um, in addition to your basics of chemistry, there's a lot of um, biology, microbiology, skin physiology, and even physics involved in developing consumer products. 
Great. And Nala, maybe you can um, talk a little bit about how chemistry, what it is that you do, and then the, how chemistry plays a role in your science. Okay, thank you very much for introduction. Uh, as a dermatologist, uh, our main concern is skin care and uh, health care, really. Uh, so we're interested more in the health side of things and we interact often with chemistry in a not so positive way because we tend to see a lot of side effects, whether it be irritant reactions or allergic reactions to a lot of these chemicals that are used. So our view is slightly different from everyone else's. Well, I think that's great because we're going to discuss a little bit your opinions of, of you know, what are good chemicals and what are bad chemicals. And so Anne, maybe you could give us a little overview of what you do as a group leader and the role that chemistry plays in your work. Sure. Um, as a group leader, I, I manage chemists, but I also am a little bit of a hybrid type of person where I am also working on the bench as well. Um, and if I had to describe hair color chemistry, I would say it's, it's a combination of chemistry and art and social awareness. It's a little bit of everything um, because you're not just working with uh, a substrate, that, uh, your hair, uh, you're not just working with a substrate that you're just playing with in the lab, you're working with something that has a very personal connection um, to people, the world around them. People are very connected you know, with their hair and it's a way of showing you know, who you are, um, what kind of, you know, identity you are, um, you know, through a physical manifestation of science. So what we're doing is with artistry where you don't necessarily know what color you're going to get. It's not like you're painting a house. Um, you're working yeah. with a substrate that already has color. So it's a very complex type of uh, research and uh, it's very exciting. So maybe you, we could start by having you explain how chemicals and hair dyes work, right? Like just the sure. biology of it and, and, sure. and what's going on there. Yeah, so you have to first think about, well, what are you trying to color, all right? So everyone thinks like hair is alive, but hair is actually dead. <laughs> hair is dead, um, except at the follicle, um, which is on your scalp. So um, your hair is primarily based of protein. Um, and what colors the hair is only a very, very small percentage of your total hair, and that's uh, melanin. Um, so for a hair color to work, um, first you gotta think about what type of hair color you want. There's actually multiple categories. What people mostly think about with hair color is oxidative permanent hair color, like the kit boxes you'd see, say, in CVS or your, your grocery store, or even the stuff that ha you get done at the salon, but there's a lot of different types. There's temporary, uh, which can wash out after one shampoo. And that's things that look like color sprays, for example. Um, if you wanted a, a streak of pink through your hair, but don't wanna have to have that for the next six weeks, um, then you'd use temporary hair color. Then there's semi-permanent, which is very much like um, painting, like regular paint where it coats the outside of the hair. Um, and then there's demi-permanent and that uses more of the standard oxidative permanent color, but it uses a lower, um, amount, uh, it uses a, a, a lower developer for that. So your oxidative permanent hair color is two main components. Uh, there's a colorant and a developer. Okay, and the colorant, you'll have um, some sort of alkaline agent. The most common that people are aware of is this, the, the smelly ammonia. Um, and what that does is it actually opens up the hair follicle. Think about your, sorry, your hair, um, uh, it opens up your hair. Uh, to actually the cuticle to open up um, for the dyes to come in. So uh, that ammonia is what's needed to, to basically open up the shingles of the roof. That's how I kind of like to describe hair. Um, so you open that up uh, and then the developer uh, has hydrogen peroxide in it. Um, that's one of the most common ingredients and that's responsible for lightening your natural hair color. That's the melanin. So uh, there's a lot going on. You're lightening the hair color of your own hair and you're depositing these dyes into your hair and then as it rinses out, the, the cuticle closes. So there's chemical reactions that are happening in your hair when you use oxidative permanent color. Um, so this, you know, you're using a lot of uh, words that sound, uh, while we know they're safe because certainly companies put in a lot of effort into uh, the safety and efficacy of these of these mm -hmm. factors. 
Uh, I wonder, Nala, if you could talk about how these chemicals impact uh, your skin and your hair and if there are uh, good chemicals and, and bad chemicals, because this is certainly what your work focuses on, how our uh, tissues respond to these chemicals. So I'd love to have your, your thoughts on that. Okay. Um, so the way I think about it um, is you have chemicals that can be used by everyone with hardly any problems, and you have pro chemicals that are toxic. So we won't talk about the toxic group of chemicals which should be avoided at all costs. A lot of the chemicals that are in cosmetics um, can be used by most people, but there are a few people that might have a specific allergic reaction to an ingredient. A good example actually is, uh, is paraffinaldiamine PPD, which is in dyes, you know, in, mm -hmm. in dyes and dark brown dyes. Now, some people, when exposed to a tiny amount of that, develop a hypersensitivity reaction. And each time they're exposed to it, they get a reaction. And they often present with this dramatic swelling of the face and quite a horrible reaction. Then they know that they are allergic to it. Um, but most chemicals can be irritating at high enough concentrations. So, so the common type of skin reaction that we see, we call an irritant dermatitis, which um, an easy way to think about it is to think of a young a person who takes up a job um, as a dishwasher and is in contact with water a lot, a lot of the time or works uh, with water as a nurse. And then all of a sudden they develop red, dry, itchy hands. So we call that an irritant reaction. And those usually depend on the exposure and the dose and the irritancy of, of products that they come across. And then there are specific products that we try and avoid. So for example, um, formaldehyde um, used to be used quite a lot at a low concentration as a preservative uh, in cosmetics and until someone discovered that if you use it uh, at higher doses, you can actually straighten hair in a water resistant way and that can last for up to about three weeks. So the Brazilian keratin treatments came into being. And I know that there is a lot of controversy around whether all of them have got high concentrations of formaldehyde or some of them have got what they call a formaldehyde releasers. So the whole thing becomes quite complex, but we did a study where we looked at all Brazilian keratin products in the South African market. And we actually found that all of them had concentrations that were at least five times the legal limit, including those that were listed as formaldehyde free. And as we know, these high doses of formaldehyde have got a high prevalence of cancer generating uh, you know, cells. So yeah, those are just a few of the things I can think of to mention. Wow, that's, uh, that's startling. So I'm wondering what can the consumer do to arm themselves? Kelly, maybe you can speak a little bit about, about this. Like what can the consumer do to arm themselves about uh, you know, determining if a product uh, or a certain chemical is safe because I can't imagine having a skin irritation reaction as the only way to to sort of say I need to stop using this product. So how can we be proactive in in understanding what we're using in and on our bodies and and uh, what may be good or bad for us? Well, I can speak to the United States. Um, the United States Food and Drug Administration regulates uh, cosmetics in the United States. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the fact that the, the FDA does not regulate. Um, the FDA regulation says that a product must be safe for consumers before it can be marketed. And that is up to the manufacturer of the product to conduct that safety testing. So in, companies employ toxicologists, chemists, biologists to evaluate the safety of the ingredients that go into a product as well as that final formulation prior to placing it on the market. In fact, the FDA says that if you haven't determined the safety of a product before placing it on the market, you need to put that on the label. Um, so that's a really important thing to keep in mind is that cosmetics are regulated. It, it, the regulation says that they need to be safe and that is in a way kind of broad. Um, where consumers can go is there's a website, cosmeticsinfo.org, that um, 
has a lot of information, not only about the industry and, and the measures they take to ensure safety, but also you can look up individual ingredients. Now there are over thousands of ingredients being used in the cosmetics industry. Um, they do make an effort to include information about most of those ingredients and put them up there for the consumer. Um, another part of that is the Personal Care Products Council, which is an organization, a nonprofit organization in the United States, has a process called the Cosmetic Ingredient Review. And that is a, a panel of independent uh, researchers, again, physicians, toxicologists, chemists, that review individual ingredients and all of the data available about them. And they make a determination about the safety. And those CIRs are also available and open to the public through the Personal Care Products Council's website. So those are a few things that consumers can look at um, with regards to ingredient safety. That's great. So in terms of uh, making a decision, a personal decision, there are resources out there that are independent entities that are reviewing cosmetics. So, so this brings me to a, a sort of a, a similar question, which is, you know, we, when I see products, there are really top of the line products that cost hundreds of dollars, like, you know, face creams that cost hundreds of dollars. And there are drugstore products that cost $10. Um, and I'm wondering if all of you could speak to uh, you know, what is the difference between these products? What is uh, in the $100 cream that's not in the $1 cream or the $2 cream? Uh, and is it really working better than, you know, why are we paying so much more? Um, so so what, is, what is accounting for that difference in cost of the premium products? Uh, I'll go ahead and start with this one. Um, you know, when it comes to um, cosmetic products, and I, I also want to expand and I think a lot of sometimes people think of a cosmetic as, as maybe a color cosmetic, like a foundation or makeup, but cosmetics also includes personal care products. So everything from deodorant to toothpaste is, is a cosmetic. And there are plenty of options available at, um, at, at um, cost effective price points. A lot of times, um, some of the cost of a product really goes into things like the packaging. And that packaging is, of course, very important. It protects the product, but sometimes there's very extravagant packaging. And there's also the marketing of the product. So if they have a celebrity spokesperson um, and, and things like that, that can also be factored into the price of a product. So you can find very reasonable, reasonably priced products that are just of, as effective as some of these higher end products. Um, so it's, it's not to say that there aren't some ingredients that are more expensive or products that are considered um, cosmetics that are also OTC uh, drug products that may have other things factored into the expense. But uh, a lot of times you're paying for sometimes marketing and packaging in those higher price points. Interesting. And then in terms of the safety of, of higher end versus not, I'm assuming the, the FDA approvals and, and um, all of those sorts of things still apply to it both. It applies to every product on the market. Every product that placed, is placed on the market should follow the federal law in the United States. And there are different regulations for different countries as well. So if you're selling into a global market, it's really important that you understand that the regulations vary and you study each of those regulations because they are different. No, I don't know if you have something to add to that. I'd love to hear. I just wanted to, I just wanted to say something about the difference between the way uh, organizations such as the FDA regulate a cosmetic vis versus a medicine, like an antibiotic, for instance. Yes. Um, because the regulation is very different. Mm -hmm. So cosmetics are generally self-regulatory. So the burden is placed on the company, to be honest. And yes. the companies as a group are, you know, expected to adhere. But unlike a pharmaceutical company that actually has to prove certain things before it can, you know, so, so, so the, the burden of proof is very, very different. And I think that is where the, the cracks are and a lot of companies sleep through the cracks because they know that, you know, 
by and large, most countries don't have people testing these products. So for instance, the Brazilian keratin uh, products that we tested were all imported, you know, from Europe and from the US. They're not South African uh, products. And, and yet all of them had, um, had those high levels of formaldehyde. So I think it's just important just for, for people to understand that there is a difference, even though it is FDA or SCC or depending on the, on the country where you are regulated, but there is a difference in the way in which they are regulated. Right, there, there's a, a difference between the, the regulations in the United States for a, a drug versus a cosmetic and a drug is intended to treat, cure or prevent a disease. And uh, a cosmetic is, is intended to cleanse, beautify or promote attractiveness. Um, but that the, the, there's also categories that cross over. So if you had a shampoo that is strictly a cosmetic, but an anti-dandruff shampoo then becomes a cosmetic drug. So there's there's categories that cross over as well with both that fit into both of those definitions. Uh, no, I, I absolutely think that um, understanding the sort of continuum of what a cosmetic is versus what a drug is is something that's so important for the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, because the point that Nala made, which is onus being on the company versus onus being on the regulatory agency, um, really, I think, is a is a very important distinction that we as consumers need to understand. So I'm wondering, Anne, if you could speak a little bit about what companies do, because you are from L'Oreal, yes. uh, to, to try to do their best to, um, in good faith, say this is a safe product and it's, this is an efficacious product. Yes, um, that, this is actually something that's very um, important to me, um, integrity, you know, of, of products, integrity, being able to stand behind what you make and that it is safe and that's extremely important and, and L'Oreal holds that value very highly and, uh, and they go above and beyond um, to meet the highest safety standards um, and they also um, launch their products internationally so they are um, adherent to the zones that where they launch um, because they can vary and uh, Nala you're right um, there the onus is on the company it's not like a regular pharmaceutical where you have like a, a countrywide standard um, so there is some flexibility in that but what I can say is that L'Oreal does go above and beyond um, in, in its safety and also you know we have an entire team that that looks at all of our formulas that we launch and you know bit by bit, raw material by raw material. Um, so we've got a highly educated staff to look through our ingredients to make sure they're safe. And one thing I really wanted to, to emphasize, and you brought up uh, that dye ingredient, Nala, um, as an example, that there can be skin sensitivity. You know, we go through um, as a company to ensure that there's a patch test that you do before you even color your hair. So if you end up having an allergic reaction, you test a small amount of the product um, on, your, um, on your arm. So if there is any itchiness after 48 hours, you should not use hair color. And what's really interesting is that um, this reaction that, that you're talking about can happen to people that have used hair color before, which is why every single time you use hair color, you have to use a patch test. And so it surprises the consumer when, wait a minute, I've been using hair color since I was 17 and I've been doing this for years and years and years. How am I allergic now? Well, that can happen because your body can react to it in a different way every time. So it's important to know your body. And that's one of my biggest things when it comes to cosmetic chemistry is that you know, we you, different companies, you know, follow different rules. What I can say is that, you know, L'Oreal, from my experience, very high safety, but you got to know your body, you know, if things are irritating to you, don't use it. Um, you know, there's a necessarily equated to being bad. Um, no, I think it's really reassuring that uh, L'Oreal is taking these steps to create sort of individualized testing, right? Because I think that um, at least from a biological perspective, it's very hard to say that 0% of people will ever uh, not react to any product. Um, so I think that personalized sort of uh, sensitization test is, is, is really um, fantastic. Um, but, you know, I guess I, what I want to ask all of you is, we often hear things like clinically approved or dermatologically tested. Um, and for maybe a company like L'Oreal or there are other companies where they keep their clinical data online and it's accessible to people. Um, 
you can kind of see what the actual test was or what the 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 analysis was. But for a vast majority of products out there that say dermatologically approved, what do these words mean? You know, they seem like they're based in rigorous science, uh, but are they really? So what do they mean? I'll go, I guess I'll go start on this one. Um, so a lot of times when you see some of these claims, they are uh, dermatologically tested or clinically tested. That basically means that there was a dermatologist involved in this study. Um, where the products were were used by uh, consumers, or that they were you know tested in a clinical situation, and those have uh, rigorous requirements. Um, what does that mean to the consumer? Um, I think it is maybe you know the consumer sees that the company has made an effort to to do their research on the product and not just make. Um, wildly make claims. Um, there are some other claims, though, that are that are even uh, are harder to define. So, if you see natural, organic, clean beauty is, is is one of the latest ones that's come up. And some of those, while there are some organic um, certification bodies, natural and uh, or there's some natural as well. But things like clean beauty are, are kind of ill-defined. There's no legal or regulatory definition to those. And a lot of times um, that leaves it up to the brand or the retailer to determine what that means. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, for instance, natural, organic or clean beauty products are any safer than your traditional beauty mm -hmm. products. And I think that's um, a little bit of, you know, some of the industry kind of, um, is, is you know promoting those words because consumers like them, but they really are in a way meaningless. Um, the safety of every product, again, going back to the, that FDA uh, federal law, they have to be safe, right? Yeah. And so how do you determine which is safer or less safe? Um, and that goes back to, to understanding toxicology uh, of a product. And that's, you know, dose and intended use of the product. There are certainly very, some toxic materials used in the creation of nail polish, right? Yeah. Uh, the, one of the main um, film formers in nail polish is nitrocellulose, uh, pretty dangerous material, right? But in the context of use, it is being used on your nail plate, which is densely packed keratin. It's very hard to penetrate. Um, so it, it is not, um, not a concern as used on it when it's formulated properly into that nail polish and then used on the nail. So safety is a really complex um, thought process and, and determination for cosmetics. I'm wondering, Nala, if you have some thoughts on, you know, um, Kelly brought up the natural products. And this is certainly like, a, you know, a, the industry buzzword, in my opinion. Um, because when I see, you know, natural beauty or organic beauty um, or homemade or, you know, whatever, uh, I'm just wondering, like, are, what is the rigor with which these products are made and how do they affect the skin? Is it, you know, are, is there more of an incidence of reaction in these sort of small homemade products versus, you know, products created by larger corporations with huge testing engines? Or is that area still un, untested. If I may, could I start with um, the dermatologically tested, clinically tested uh, question? Yes, that would yeah. be great. Yeah. Because I think, I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to that. Um, strictly speaking, those definitions are not uh, approved for cosmetics because the definition of clinic or clinical refers to a patient. Dermatological refers to disease. So unless the assessment included participant who had a skin disease, strictly speaking, it shouldn't be described as such. But often people do use that definition if there was a dermatologist that was involved in the study as Kaylee correctly said. So, but it, it is, it, 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 strictly speaking, it shouldn't really be used unless you know, there are some cosmetics. I know um, some companies might uh, use products that they want to make a claim for gentle, and they might deliberately include in their study participants, patients who've got atopic eczema, which is known to be a disease that is very sensitive right. to, to irritant uh, products. So 
strictly speaking, that kind of study could then be, you know, claimed as a, as a clinical study. When it comes to natural products, um, Kelly's spot on. I mean, you know, snake venom is natural, but it will kill you. You know, you get bitten by a snake, the venom that comes out of there is as natural as they come, but you will die. And the same can be said about uh, various chemicals. You know, you know, plants are just chemicals that are naturally occurring. Some of them are not safe. Some of them are toxic. Some of them should be avoided. Some should never be put on skin. So all of these claims are very difficult. Um, there are bodies that accredit uh, products for being organic or acceptable as natural. And there are some cutoffs that are sometimes used for certain ingredients. If you've got 30% of an ingredient, you can claim that the product is natural. But I think it's, you know, it's six of one and half a dozen of the other. It's, it's just a very complex um, issue to try and resolve, yeah. But there are products that are nice to use uh, in cosmetics, things like shea butter and cocoa butter. And there are products that, you know, have got very nice beneficial um, uses like they will hydrate the skin and we call them humectants. So they are very nice to use on the skin because they've got very specific, uh, you know, benefits when they are used on the skin. And those are the ones that are often used and claimed as, as natural. Uh, so I just want to go back to your earlier point about the medical terms uh, versus the buzzwords that are used for marketing, um, like dermatologically tested or clinically tested versus the buzzwords that are used for marketing. Um, in cases where things are actually clinically tested or dermatologically tested, how broadly are they tested? What different skin types, um, you know, where in the skin, sun exposed versus not, different racial backgrounds, ages. I'm just wondering how broad is this testing? And Anne, I'd love to hear from you also about, you know, with regards to this um, and your work. Katie, do you want um, yeah, to start? Do you want me to start? <laughs> Either. You're the expert, guys. <laughs> no, 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 I'm happy, I'm happy for uh, cosmetic companies make a an effort to test their products on a uh, very diverse group of consumers to begin with. Um, generally, you know, they're looking at different skin tones, different age age ranges, etc. Um, and the area of use really depends on where the product is in, intended to be used. If you're doing a claims type of study. Um, so if you're looking at a hand cream versus a face cream, um, but when we do kind of, there's some types of safety studies that we, that we commonly do, if, uh, um, testing for uh, allergic reaction. Um, we may test several materials on one panelist. So we're gonna use somewhere where we have a lot of surface area, right? So we're going to test on their back where you can do multiple sites. Um, you mentioned, and just a kind of another interesting area, sometimes when we're looking at um, uh, different uh, skin and anti-aging products, we're, we're gonna look at different areas of the skin for a comparison too. So if you're, you want with in, in, in panelist comparison to some of the youngest parts of your body, right? Or are the least sun exposed. So you might, might be looking at, at someone's, you know, backside um, for that type of area. So there's different areas of cosmetic testing. And again, that really goes back to the intended use of the product or if it's safety testing. Um, yeah, I, I would like to add on to that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a important that things are used for cosmetics are used for in their intended use, um, and uh, it's important to to you know use it as directed to. So a lot of times, issues with with someone's um, safety concern is that they might have put on say a hair remover for double the amount of time. They said, oh, well, maybe it, it it bothered you know irritated my skin. Well, you did use it for double the amount of time. You know, for example. Um, but I think it's important to note that, as I had said before, um, not just hair color, but but cos cosmetic chemistry is about social awareness. It's about knowing your consumer, and I think it's important to always have it at heart, whether you're, you know, an, an introductory chemist in a lab or you're a, a high um, high person running a research and development lab. Um, to always think about who you're working for. 
Um, and everyone has such different needs. Um, if you think about skin, there's combination skin, there's dry skin, there's oily skin, there's dry scalp, there's oily scalp, there's irritated scalp. There's all sorts of things that people are trying to fix to make basically make their life just a little bit better, a little bit more enjoyable. And I think that's the heart of cosmetic chemistry is a way that we can help each individual in, 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 any, in, in all sorts of different ways. Um, maybe that means like uh, you know, ha having hydrated the skin after, um, I don't know, working for me, working in the lab all day. <laughs> uh, hand cream is extremely important. <laughs> um, but things like that where, you know, it, there's always the always a thought of, of the consumer, especially if, if it's um, a certain demographic that they're trying to gear towards, they will do consumer testing with that group of people. And then in addition, if we want to do a wide range inclusive type of product, then we'll test on all different type of people. So that that's always at heart. I think it for at least what I can say for my experience at L'Oreal, and I think that's really important to always be thinking about what you're working with, what you're making, and who you're making it for. Great. Um, so this is something you touched upon, which is there's a bit of an echo. Uh, sorry about that, folks. Um, which is you know inclusivity, and this year has focused a lot on racial justice and cosmetics and marketing have been a part of those conversations. So I'm wondering if each of you can speak about, you know, issues in the field and how the industry is trying to address them, how you how your work is trying to address them, um, and what more needs to happen to to make uh, this field more inclusive, to make cosmetics more inclusive, um, and address the needs of all. Uh, from my perspective, I think you know it's all about. Um, redefining what we we think is beautiful, um, and I think there has you know has long, been a long-standing kind of um, narrow view, and we saw a lot of change happening. Um, for example, just in uh, when we look at you know one of my areas of expertise is color cosmetics. Uh, we saw a few years ago the launch of uh, Fenty Beauty's foundation, which had a line of, of 40 shades of foundation. Previously, there were much uh, narrower ranges and um, product lines for different for darker skin tones were, were a separate product line. I think we're seeing, you know, that kind of ushered in a new um, a new era where it's important that all foundation lines be inclusive. And I think, you know, that that goes back to broadening what is our definition of beauty. And I think that that inclusivity also uh, includes a much broader reach as well too. If we think about the, um, you know, our, our different abilities community and LGBTQ communities. So I think uh, the inclusivity discussion is, is one that's, that's uh, overdue and, and the industry is certainly making great strides in, in addressing it. Hey, and I don't know if you, you yeah. because you brought it up. You... I'm, I'm, I'm super passionate about this. Um, yeah. I feel like when it comes to cosmetics, you know, however you, you know, if you, if it's, you know, putting on bright makeup or maybe just putting on mascara for the day, or just if you're lucky, maybe using some face cream in the morning. Um, it's a way to express yourself and express your individuality. And I think that it, the cosmetic industry is very much trending in an inclusivity type of, of atmosphere um, where you've got people that maybe that n might have not had a voice, have a voice through color cosmetics. Um, as you were saying, the LGBTQ uh, community and all sorts of different types of, of people that can be represented in, in, in their own way and express themselves through their hair color, their makeup um, and show their individuality. But there's something that's always there for you you know, for you, because it's it's meant for you. It's not a cookie cookie cutter type of of uh, solution where we've got one hand cream for every single person or one color lipstick for every every person that wants to wear it. It's it's a way of expression and art, and and I think that that makes it a safe place for a lot of different people and to have that kind of community where we can be different and be individualistic and be together at the same time. Nala, what about your thoughts on um, racial inclu inclusivity in, in studies and in research? 
um, and health disparities and addressing health, dermatological disease in, in, you know, across different racial lines. So um, I think I agree with Anne and Kelly that um, more recently there is an attempt to be inclusive. But um, I have to say that there is more talk than action. A lot more talk than action. And the other issue that people need to think about is who sets the agenda? Who makes the decision that those products serve me with my needs? And what is happening, what has happened in South Africa, in Africa, and in a lot of um, you know, developing countries, middle economy countries, is that a lot of the research and development occurs in Paris and in London mm -hmm. and in France. And ready-made things are brought for production and for packaging and for selling. And there just has not been enough. I mean, I'm aware that um, when I started work, working, uh, you know, in this uh, whole uh, field, I had a big problem with relaxers. And I, you know, I had a, 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 a presentation at a meeting in Princeton. And for the first time, I actually asked the audience, how many of you are cosmetic formulators? And it was like 90% of the room. And I said, Oh, yippee, I'm delighted. I've never spoken to so many cosmetic formulators in my life. And then I started to show them data about what relaxers are doing to people's scalps and the scarring alopecia, the damage that we see. And, and I said, but you know, sodium hydroxide was first discovered by chance. I mean, the first patent that we have for a relaxer was actually discovered by chance by someone called Gareth Morgan. And the story goes that he, apparently was a, um, a machinist and he was looking for something to reduce friction on his, he was a tailor looking for something to reduce friction and tried various chemicals and tried this particular one and then gets called into the house by his wife and he wipes his hands on a piece of, of fleece. And when he comes back, the fleece has changed character. And he tried the product on a, what they call an Aris dog, which is a dog with very curly hair, poor dog. Apparently the fair of the dog straightened and then tried it on himself and then you know registered the first patent. Now that was about 115 years ago. You know, fast forward now, we're still using sodium hydroxide. I mean, a chemical that should be going down a drain for a blocked drain, not on someone's head. And even the other products that are similar to it that we're using, the technology is still very similar. And so as far as I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned, yes, there are some moves, but by no means is enough being done. And we need to get consumers to set the agenda and not have the agenda set in central places and then the products are shipped off to the rest of the world as if you know the environment in which they are used doesn't matter. I mean, I know L'Oreal has recently opened up a place in Johannesburg where they're starting to do research. And I'm hoping that more cosmetic uh, companies are going to do the same. The research needs to happen where the people are because we know co cosmetics, you know, will be affected by the humidity, by the temperature and all sorts of things yeah. that we need to test. No, that's it. I mean, I think inclusivity isn't just about, I totally agree with you, inclusivity isn't just about saying we're serving the needs of everyone. It's also inclusivity and decision-making. Um, and, and I think that's a really, really important point. So I know we, we need to get into audience Q and A questions, but I just wanna um, end our discussion before we get to the audience Q and A uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, which is uh, looming over all of us, unfortunately, um, and our use of hand sanitizers. So, so um, I think many people don't realize that hand sanitizers are a cosmetic. Um, and, and meanwhile, you know, soaps are not considered a cosmetic. So how, how did things get classified as cosmetics or not? And, and in terms of hand sanitizer use during the pandemic, what should consumers know? Okay, so I have some background in, in formulating hand sanitizer. Um, so I'll start at the beginning when we talk about the FDA regulating cosmetics versus drugs. So again, a, a drug, uh, the definition is to treat, mitigate, or prevent a disease. 
Um, and a cosmetic is strictly to cleanse, beautify, promote attractiveness. Um, for some reason in the original FD&C, uh, the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, which was written, I believe in 1938, traditional soap, and that is only the um, alkali salt of a fatty acid. So that's a very narrow definition of soap, right? Um, so when we talk about soaps today, most soaps that we buy at the, at the store are synthetic surfactants, but we still refer to them as soap. So when we say soap isn't regulated by the FDA, that is only that traditional alkali salt of a fatty acid type of soap, which, um, are not typically the ones we see at the store. So your liquid hand soaps, those are based on synthetic surfactants. So those are considered a cosmetic. Um, in the case of hand sanitizer, um, it is meant to prevent disease. Um, so um, it fits that drug definition, but also you need to protect your skin barrier, right? If your skin is damaged and dry, it is no longer a good barrier and that's a barrier to moisture loss and as well as to um, microbes. So you want to protect the skin barrier by also making it moisturizing. So a lot of hand sanitizers you will see will contain something like glycerin or other emollients to protect the skin barrier. So that's where it becomes also a drug and a cosmetic. And I always say when we're talking about cosmetic formulation matters and it's really important. Uh, when you're in chemistry classes, sometimes you're dealing with one or two ingredients, right? Thinking about an acid dissociation into water. When we're talking about cosmetics, we're thinking of 15 different ingredients or more to create a product that gets really complicated. And that, that product has to do a lot of things. It has to look, look nice, feel nice, last for two years on the shelf, not grow bacteria. Um, so there's a lot of things that cosmetics has to do and it's really complicated formulation. And so back to hand sanitizer, what I think it's important for people to know is it's not just the, the alcohol, which is isopropanol or ethanol that are used in hand sanitizers that, that is there for the efficacy. You need a certain amount of water. The ethanol will dissolve the lipid membrane of the bacteria um, and help desiccate the cell, but you need a, some amount of water to help denature the proteins within the cell as well. So it's important to have some amount of water in that formulation. Um, so that's why you see uh, typically somewhere around 65 to 70 some percent of uh, alcohol in a hand sanitizer formulation. Great, thank you so much. So. Um, we're going to go to audience questions. So our first question is a two-parter, which is, uh, do chemicals and serums, essences, and anti-aging treatments actually uh, work, or are they just a hype and fad? And, uh, and also this individual wants to know what the impact of these products have on the environment, for instance, byproducts or face masks that, you know, we wash off um, and then drain into our water. Um, how, does, how do these products and, and how do their byproducts impact our environment? So there are a lot of um, ingredients used in, in skincare, um, things that we, we know very well, right? Um, vitamins, uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, um, retinoids that we know are very uh, effective ingredients and they have a long history and, and long study of use. Um, but then we see, um, you know, uh, very trendy ingredients pop up every once in a while. Um, and they, they have less research behind them. You know, I always tell people to think about, you know, what is the gold standard? And the gold standard in anti-aging is, is retinol. And we have really yet to determine anything is as effective. You see a lot of things that will claim it's, it's similar, um, but I have really yet to see any research that, that is comparable. So, um, you know, that's kind of my perspective on go with the tried and true ingredients that, that we know. Um, everyone's looking for the next big thing, but it, I think it'll be, it'll be, you'll see it compared to those tried and true ingredients head to head if it really is efficacious. I think on, on that note, um, like I said earlier, listen to your body. Um, people can say certain things, you know, all different types of companies, different standards. Um, what I can say is that for a bigger company like L'Oreal, we do a lot of consumer testing. Um, so we're testing on real people, getting their real feedback. 
do you like it? Do you not like it? What don't, what do you like about it? Things like that. But, um, you know, everyone's skin or hair is a little bit different. So I think in a way to, to some extent it's, it's, you know, does it work for you? Yeah. Nala, do you have any, do you have anything to add or anything to say about the environmental impacts um, of the byproducts um, and how those are measured? I mean, one can speak for hours about the environmental impact. Yeah. And I think a lot of companies are aware and are trying to use biodegradable, you know, packaging and things like that. So I think it is something that we should all just aspire to do. Yeah. Um, I agree. So, so the next question is by a participant who noticed that some of her male colleagues don't take the chemistry of beauty very seriously or as seriously as she does. Um, have any of you encountered this in your professional career? Um, and how do you um, approach it? How do you counter this sort of bias? I'm I smiling because it, it happened. <laughs> but go, go ahead, Kelly. <laughs> you go ahead and start. Um, I remember, honestly, it was when I was an intern, so I hadn't even started uh, my actual like, like full career at L'Oreal and I remember being at a party and uh, some I was talking to uh, someone and he said, Oh, what are you working on? I'm like, Oh, I work on mascara. It was my my internship project it's like mascara. Don't, haven't they figured that out by now? They already know mascara. And what's funny and what's beautiful about it all is that when you're making a cosmetic um, it is such a, a, a wonderful um, collection of all different things working together because you change one little thing and your whole product can literally fall apart. Um, and it's, it's the, the beautiful interaction with everything together to make something new. And it's about striving to do something better you know, each time around that, you know, there's a way to, you know, make things better. You're not just rubbing charcoal on your eyelashes. You know, oh, mascara has been done. We can just keep it up like that. But there's an, uh, so many different ways to improve different ingredients you can use um, to, to improve upon your, your products. So no, there, we're not at the end point for cosmetic chemistry and there's always ways to improve. Yeah, and I, I, I've experienced the same, I think. Um, and uh, I, I, this has been ongoing in the industry for a very long time. Uh, one of the early chemists in, uh, and you might appreciate this, Florence Wall, uh, who was an early cosmetic chemist, uh, created a kind of a, a bit of science around and artistry around hair dye. Um, and she actually worked with the FDA in developing the cosmetic portion of the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. And one of her passions was fighting for cosmetic science to be recognized as a real science. And this is, we're talking the 1920s, 30s, 40s. Um, so we still kind of struggle with that. And I, I go back to that formulation design challenge. Uh, a lot of chemists will work with a, a single or, or a few chemicals. When you're a cosmetic chemist and you're working to develop that product with all of those different chemicals that go into the formula, and again, that formula has to be shelf stable for many years. That, that formula has to smell nice. It has to feel nice or the consumer is not going to use it. Um, it also has to be effective. It has to deliver on, on what you want it to do. Um, and it, again, you have to prevent, you know, microbes from growing in it. Um, it, it there's a lot of requirements. So I, I would challenge somebody who doesn't think cosmetic chemistry is a real science to go ahead and develop a, a, an anti-aging skin cream that lasts, you know, that can, um, you know, be successful on the market. I think that would be a, a pretty uh, interesting challenge. <laughs> One thing oh. I want to quickly add is that it's, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry. One, one thing I just wanted to say is that it's extremely important to have the male perspective as well at work. Um, I, I don't want to discount that. You know, I think it's extremely useful to have, you know, a diverse workforce um, because so, yeah, well, maybe this guy had never put on mascara, but you know what? I know people in my mascara lab when I was an intern, guys and girls both trying on mascara, mm -hmm. doing, yep. you know, having fun with it. And I think, it's important to note that, you know, you don't have to be a woman to do cosmetic chemistry. And, and it's, it's, it's a, I think, extremely valuable when you have um, a, a diverse workforce to do it. Nala, you were saying something? 
Yes, I was just going to say it's like any 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 career, you know, uh, there will be biases. Uh, people still think dermatologists are cosmetic scientists or makeup artists. <laughs> oh my God. You know, there are lots of people who think a dermatologist is just a makeup artist or a cosmetic dermatologist who just injects Botox and doesn't treat any, you know, serious disease. And we, we've been to medical school and we look after really sick people. You know, we have severe allergies, drug reactions, we get admitted to hospital. And what people often forget is that actually the skin can tell you so much about what's going on in the body. You know, there's so many clues that you can pick up about heart failure, about neurological disorders that are just in the skin. So I think it's just a bias that's there, but as long as we take our discipline seriously and we perform it both as an art and a science, we, 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 know, we, we, we get on with it and, and show the difference, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really like all three of you emphasizing the intellectual rigor of what it is that that you do because I think it's not a trivial endeavor it's not like you're going in and mixing two chemical skills and saying good enough it's there, you know there is such a deep um, scientific history and medical history behind what you do so this really brings us to the next question which is there are a few participants who are chemistry students who want to become cosmetic chemists um, can can all of you or one of you speak to um, how one can be more marketable or enter the field with a, a bachelor's, master's in arts or a PhD degree? What, you know, what paths did you take to get where you are maybe? Um, my experience was starting with a, a bachelor's degree. Um, and I think a lot of cosmetic chemists begin in the field this way. If, um, I think if you're interested in formulation design, um, uh, there's a lot of entry level positions where you come in as a technician to start in the field. Um, but that's not to say there aren't different positions for masters and, and PhD levels. There are different, um, different positions and it, it really depends on what you want to achieve and, and the type of work. And I always um, mention too, there are many different types of careers in cosmetic chemistry. It's not a lot of people immediately think of the formulation chemist, but um, there are quality control chemists, there are upstream researchers developing new, say, polymers for use in, in cosmetics. Um, and then there's also technical marketing um, people as well who are teaching people how to use chemicals. So um, there's a variety of different um, areas of, of cosmetic industry jobs. And I'll just uh, give a quick Society of Cosmetic Chemists, their website is a great place to look for information about careers in cosmetic science. Can I just put in one quick word? Um, yeah, yeah, we'd love to hear your journey. We've, we've established what we think is the first in the world, an advanced diploma in cosmetic formulation science. We think it's the first one to be offered at a medical school. And it's pretty unique because you get taught by dermatologists and by cosmetic scientists, and you get exposure to all the disciplines. And you also get to do cytotox so cytotoxicology work in the lab. You see the tissue cultures and you see the clinical side. So we, we're very proud of our program. We've trained 30 uh, students so far, and uh, we accept a bachelor. And it's a nice blended program where you come into the lab and it's full-time on site for two months. And then we place you in a cosmetic uh, company, laboratory R&D lab, where you, when you work and you, you carry on online and then you write the exams at the end of the year. So anyone's welcome to apply. Are you accepting professors from NYU? Because I would we, love to come. We, <laughs> we are inundated with applicants, but we very yeah, I mean, open to anyone you know, coming from from, from the rest of the world, it's quite open. And Cape Town is lovely. I mean, it's it was voted one of the best cities in the world. I mean, two oceans and a mountain, where else are you going to get there? Yeah. Um, and so Anne, could you tell us a bit about sort of how you got to your position and your journey and what you recommend? My journey is very nonlinear. Um, I, <laughs> I found out about cosmetic chemistry while I was getting my PhD. It was not my my plan initially and I found out about an internship and I applied for it and then found a passion and uh, interning is one of the best ways to do it they just while you're in undergrad to get exposed to different companies and different types of cultures 
and different types of work, you can really be, that's, I'd say, the way to make yourself really marketable. I don't think you have to have a certain degree um, level in the sense you can be marketable as an uh, as a, um, a BA or a, a, a master's student or a PhD. I ended up being a PhD at that time, but you can really be successful at all different levels. And I think what's important is getting yourself out there, um, connecting mm-hmm. with people. Networking is so important and there's a lot of opportunities to do that. There's the so- Society of Cosmetic Chemists. Um, mm-hmm. There's finding people through LinkedIn and talking to people in companies you're interested in or areas of research that you're interested in. They can be professors as well. So there's think about the scientific community. It's, it's vast and honestly, many people want to talk about it and get connected. Yes, I mean, so we are going to close out on that message of connectivity and 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 access and and reaching out. Um, I want to really thank my experts for giving, um, sharing your perspective, sharing your time and your expertise with us. And I also want to thank the American Chemical Society and the Aspen Institute for Science and Society program for putting together this fantastic panel. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and learned quite a bit. So thank you all for your time. And uh, thanks all of you for tuning in and listening. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye all.